Spelljammer has received a lot of criticism when they released it for fifth edition. In today's video, we are going to be asking that burning question. Does it suck? Most of the criticism has been against the setting book, the Astral Adventures Guide. So we're gonna start with that and I'm gonna kind of work through some of the issues and see if they're valid or not. Starting with the races, they're poorly written. Uh, I'm not gonna argue. I think that the races in general are fun and I like a lot of the races. I've had a chance to play some of them and I do enjoy them, but they are pretty poorly written as well as just most of the book. The Hadizi, for example, everyone's already talked about how you can travel up to 2,500 feet in a single round with it. But what was more obnoxious is essentially jumping. You could kind of jump glide and travel up to 150 feet in your turn. And because your gliding doesn't use your movement, you technically would not provoke any attacks of opportunity. So that's a lot of movement speed without having to use anything to avoid attacks of opportunity, which if you didn't know, they have quietly updated on D&D Beyond, which I thought was funny because they haven't added any notes or changes don't show up on the change log. They were just quietly like, shh, this has always been what it is. But if you have the book, which <laughs> my goodness, this book just feels so small. Yeah, so the original, you're not incapacitated or wearing heavy armor. You could extend your skin membrane and glide. When you do so, you perform the following aerial maneuvers. You can move up to five feet horizontally for every one foot you descend in the air at no movement cost to you. And when you would take damage from a fall, you can use your reaction to reduce the damage to zero, which is interesting that in the original, you didn't have to use your reaction to glide, but you did have to use your reaction to avoid fall damage. What they updated it to was they took out that whole section where you can't be wearing medium or heavy armor. Now you can wear medium or heavy armor and you, <laughs> the way they say this is just funny. When you fall at least 10 feet above the ground, you can use your reaction to extend your skin membranes to glide horizontally a number of feet equal to your walking speed. And you take zero fall damage from the fall. You determine the direction of your glide. So you can glide up to your movement speed in a round as long as you fall 10 feet but I find it funny they say as long as you fall 10 feet above ground, <laughs> why throw that caveat on there above the ground? Does that mean it doesn't work in the underdark when you're underground, you just can't glide? Or are you saying that if you're in wild space and hypothetically you've got two ships that are close enough that their air envelopes are overlapping, but they're not touching and you wanna jump off your crow's nest and glide to the other one, that when you get between the two, because there's no ground beneath you, you'll just drop at that point and fall into wild space. Is that what you're saying? Wouldn't you say you have to be above the ground? It just seems weird. I'm sure it's just like a flavor thing. They also still have a swim speed for the GIF. I'm just saying, I'm still pushing. We need to take the swim speed away from the hippo people and give it to the turtle people. Come on, wizards. Let's fix this one. But again, overall, the races are pretty fun. I don't think too many people have issues with the races. There might be a little bit of balancing stuff because these races are very strong. And with that Hadizy fix, I think that the races are good. I liked them. Moving on to the astral adventuring section, and I think this is where the majority of the complaints come from. We're gonna start off with traveling. Uh, the speeds at which you travel and kind of how that's ran. When cruising, you can travel up to 100 million miles in a day. So yeah, that's their version of like light speed, but definitely a lot slower because light speed would be 16 billion miles in a day, if my math is correct. Very likely could be wrong. That's cool. When you get too close to an object, you will automatically drop out of that like cruising speed and you'll go into your fly speed or your combat speed, whatever you want to call it. I think they refer to it as fly speed. The issue is they don't have mechanics for this in that there's not an exact guide. They say that it's just up to the dungeon master. Whenever the dungeon master thinks that you're close enough, they'll pull you out of it. You should be able to see pretty quickly what caused you to drop out of your cruising speed. Personally, I don't have any issues with it. I understand why some people that want like structured rules might have issues with it, but as the dungeon master, I like that they just kind of leave it up to you and they kind of give rough guides. Where things get a little bit weird with this is I would assume it doesn't say that you can't go into cruising speed if you're in something else's gravity or air envelope, but it would be a safe assumption, right? If you understand all the rules, you know where I'm going with this, because the next thing they talk about are air envelopes and gravity planes. And with a gravity plane, again, they give hard rules for it, but I would prefer that they would have only done this to a ship. I, I, this is where it's weird. And like, I don't know if they play tested it because the way the gravity plane works is it extends as far in front and above you is the height and length of your ship or of the planet. So if your ship is five feet long, your air envelope 
and Gravity Plane are 15 feet long, because it's five feet behind you, the five feet of your ship, and five feet in front of you. And then it operates the same for above. Where this gets really weird is, take Earth for example. Earth's air envelope is 60 miles. If we use these rules, it would be 8,000 miles, which means because the ship's fly speed is so slow, averaging at about four miles an hour, it would take you almost three months to land your ship on Earth or like an Earth equivalent sized planet. And it would take you another three months to take back off. Roughly, some could do it a little bit faster, but that is a long time. I don't think anybody play tested this where it's like, how does this work exactly? But I, I think that they just leave it up to the Dungeon Master and the Dungeon Master will probably say like, man, when you get like a mile off the surface, you can just take off. Uh, the next, and this is where things are poorly written again, we see uh, at the end of the speed section, it says while moving at its fly speed, a spell jamming ship is generally as maneuverable as a seafaring vessel of a similar size. Cool. If you look at Ghosts of Salt Marsh and those ships, that is the impression that you should have of a spell jamming ship as it can make 190 degree turn on its turn. Now on to ship to ship combat. The complaints people have had is a lack of mechanics and they feel like they've kind of just been, Dungeon Master's been thrown out there to figure out ship to ship combat, which, Eh. They give you a guide on starting distance. Then they give you for initiative, they recommend just side initiative, which is uh, an option in the Dungeon Master's Guide. I'm in favor of it. I think that's the easiest way to run it. It would be really awkward to not do it that way. They give a note on shipboard weapons. And I think this is where a lot of the complaints come from. They basically say, don't use the shipbound weapons unless they're too far out for what your character can do. So yeah, it sounds like they don't really want you using the shipboard weapons. They want you doing what your character can do, which makes it probably easier for the dungeon master if they don't need to learn a whole bunch of mechanics for ship to ship combat. They have rules for moving and steering the ship, but some of these contradict what we had said earlier, where they said that the ships would steer similarly to sea bound vessels, but then there's this line right here that says, on its turn, a ship can be turned or reoriented so that all its weapons can aim and fire at any target within range, regardless of where they are situated on the deck. This is here so that it's very easy to run, that they don't need to worry about being tactical and which side the ship is facing and are you chasing someone and then you can't use the side weapons. Whatever weapon you wanna use, you can hit it. Me as the Dungeon Master, I don't need to worry about, you know, asking which direction the ship's facing. It's just very easy. I think that this type of stuff makes people not like it as much though, because there isn't anything tactical. It's, yeah, you can just fire whatever weapons you want that are on there, or your characters can just shoot whatever weapons or spells that can reach. But I'll say it's very simple, which is kind of fifth edition's thing. They try to make the entire game very simple and you can homebrew stuff and make things more complicated if you want. I will be doing a video on how you can improve combat, but this is enough to get you going. Like this is enough that you can play through it. Uh, they have rules on crashing, which again, they're just very basic. You can crash into something. It does pretty much the same damage to you and the ship that you're hitting, unless you have a ram or something on the front of it, and then you can take half damage. If you want something really easy that you can do, again, Ghosts of Salt Marsh, you can use some of those rules. And I very much prefer their method of steering the ship. If you want to just talk about jobs and rules and being on a ship, they don't give you a whole lot. You have the captain, the spell jammer, and then the crew. Those are the only three jobs in the spell jammer setting. On Ghost of Salt Marsh, you have officers. You've got captain, first mate, bosun, quartermaster, surgeon, and cook. Quite a few jobs. I don't know why we couldn't have those in spell jammer as well. And maybe for certain ones, if you want to keep it simple, you could have certain positions fall under uh, like captain or something where it's like, if you don't want to have a first mate, you can just have the captain be the first mate as well. Or, you know, like that's an optional position. Like you could have a list of optional ones and then have like captain and spell jammer be the only mandatory ones. And maybe the spell jammer is the captain, like whatever. It doesn't really matter. I just feel like they could have added more stuff to it. Um, so back to the ship to ship combat. The ships are very slow, which I'm not a huge fan of when I'm thinking of like a spaceship, but I, I guess it's fine. It's whatever. Um, they have rules for boarding a ship. <laughs> which it's here. Uh, the rules for it aren't actually any new rules. It's more just a recommendation that if you get within five feet of another ship, you can board it, assuming that your players have prepared the action to board the ship and they use their reaction to do so. Very simple. Again, you're not learning any new rules. So I don't really have any issues with that. That's probably how I would run it, but it's not exactly like rules on boarding. And it does seem like that's what they want you to do it. It sounds like they're pretty encouraging of you getting close and then jumping on their ship and fighting more like 
melee style combat and that's kind of what your ship to ship combat will look like and less like shooting at the other ships which is fine because if you don't have the mending spell repairing your ship is a pain the rules for repairing the ship again i just i don't know if it, it felt low effort honestly so repairing your ship with non-magical means you need to be docked you need to be you can't be out in space you need to go in and yeah they say be berthed which basically means you need to be at a dock or uh on land. It takes one day and 20 gold to repair a ship one HP. So if you have a 300 HP ship and you lose a third, one third of your health, it will take you over three months and 2000 gold to repair your ship, which seems just super long, especially when compared to the magical way of doing it, which is essentially would take you 14 hours and be free because you can cast mending, which will heal your ship 1d8 plus your spellcasting modifier, I'm assuming the plus three. Yeah, in like 14 hours, you'd be able to heal up the same. So that just, the balance there seems so off. Now one is magical, so I guess I understand that, but I feel like it shouldn't take that long or be that expensive to repair a ship through non-magical means, but whatever. We already talked about air envelopes and the way that that works. I'm okay with it if it was just for ships. I think the way that it works for ships is completely fine. The gravity planes, a little bit weird, but I, I'm okay with it. We have rules for it. It's not just throwing you out there and telling the dungeon masters, figure it out. They do have rules for how some of this stuff works, which, which I like. Some people say that they just didn't add a ton of stuff. They do have rules for fishing. So if you wanted to do some space fishing, they have rules. This is a fully fleshed out setting, okay? <laughs> you don't have rules for fishing and lack basic rules for something else, right? Wizards wouldn't do that. The astral playing section is, I, I don't know. It's, it's weird because you, they already have some stuff on the astral plane. They added a little bit more. Um, I do find it funny because they have a guide for creating the astral plane. And if you play any AL games, they just put their guide for creating um, Adventures League modules. Uh, and they say that it, with that, you can create your own wild space system using the guide provided in the astral adventuring guide. The guide provided a typical wild space system has a sun plus a number of planets and moons orbiting it. That's it. That's all you got for me. I know in older editions, they did like tables where you could determine the amount of planets. Um, but all they say is, yeah, it probably should have a sun and maybe a few planets. We don't know how many. And then probably some moons too. And it's all like orbiting the sun. But that's typical. You could have a planet that's being orbited by suns, I suppose. Uh, so basically they don't even have a guide. And if you don't know what that might look like, planets orbiting a sun with some moons, um, you could look at Doom Space or the light of Xerixis. So this would be Xerixis space. Uh, yeah, and you can use those as models when creating your own wild space system. All right, I've heard a lot of people complain that they only have two spells and three magic items that they included. But if we compare this to some other settings, for example, Eberron, which I'm a, a pretty big fan of, I like Eberron, they introduced zero new spells. So in this, they gave you like air bubble and creating a spell jamming helm. And then the magic items were like a spacesuit, spell jamming, helm, and a watch. So I guess I wasn't disappointed in the lack of spells or magic items because I wasn't expecting a whole lot. I do think they probably could have done a little bit more with magic items that would be useful in space, but this isn't like a Tasha's Cauldron of Everything or a Strix Haven where, you know, a lot of new spells are going to be introduced. It's, it's, just, it's a new setting. So any new spells and magic items are probably only going to be things that are required for that setting. So like I said, I wasn't I wasn't upset about this. This is pretty much what I was expecting. The next was the Rock of Brawl. One chapter for an entire city is a bit short. Um, they mostly gave like highlights of the city and I think they just expect the Dungeon Master to do a lot of the work. I, I guess I'm fine with that. I do that anyway. I like, I don't necessarily want to create my own setting all the time or city but maybe adding my own bars and stuff into a city I don't have any issues with. And so I didn't have a problem with it. I thought that it was fine and they gave you enough flavor for you to get the feeling of what 
that city is like. Then we have the two other books. I'm not gonna talk about those in detail as people don't seem to have as many issues with them. Um, they're both all right. I think most people's issues are they look at older editions like second edition and they see what it could be. And when they're comparing, they're like, ah, Wizards of the Coast was just lazy when they converted this over because there were so many things that were already fleshed out that they just didn't even convert over. And I understand that argument and agree with it. I don't know why they didn't pull more of it over. I feel like it would have been easy for them to do. But if you haven't been around that long, if you're new to fifth edition or new to Spelljammer, which is what I wanna focus on, is this worth buying? Is this good? It's enough to get you started. It's enough to play Spelljammer. And I would say that it is good, that it is acceptable, except for one small issue that I haven't talked about yet. This is the most expensive book I can find that they have available right now. Most other books on D&D Beyond are around 30 bucks and most of them are actually on sale for like 25. Or if you go to Wizards of the Coast and you try and buy a hard copy of it, this is still like $65 and even the new Dragonlance one coming out, um, that one's only like $55, I don't remember exactly. Uh, but this is still the most expensive book. So looking at D&D Beyond right now, if you wanna buy Spelljammer, it's $50. If you wanna buy Journey Through the Radiant Citadel, 30 bucks. If you wanna buy Eberron Rising from the Last War, 25 bucks. And so this being between 50 and $70, uh, $70 absolutely not. This is the shortest book I own. All three of them together are still the shortest book I own. It is technically the same pages as Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, but because it's split across three books, it has nine pages of credits, table of content, those sorts of things, whereas Tasha's Cauldron of Everything only has three. So as far as like pages with actual content on it, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is longer. And most other books, I mean, you take this book, like look how thin this is. Now let's take Monsters of the Multiverse. Yeah. I had to make sure I said the right book. They're not even close. And Boo's Astral Menagerie is just as long as this is. They're all 64 pages. It is short. Now, if you were to say that it was $30 and this is a $10 book essentially, Boo's Astral Menagerie is 10 bucks and The Adventure is 10 bucks. Like, like I think that it's $10 worth of content. Like I would, I would be happy with a $10 purchase. So if it was a $30 book, yeah, I, I think that's totally worth $30. Um, I, I'd be pretty happy with it. Still maybe disappointed if you've been around for longer and you know what Spelljammer could be. But if you're newer or you just want it easily adapted to fifth edition, I think this is a great place to start. As I said, the races, I enjoyed the races. They give you 16 ships with maps. If we're gonna compare this to Eberron, Eberron has sky ships and not a single mechanic for sky ship combat, not a single map for a sky ship. They have one kind of image of a sky ship, but you can't use that if your players ever get on a sky ship. The only thing they provide for sky ships is how much it costs to charter one. And so I think that this has some value in it. They obviously added a few things with the 16 ships, the races. And so it's, I think it's about $10 worth of content. And they give a very basic guide for running Spelljammer adventures, running space adventures. But when you look at the price they're charging for it, I completely understand why people are upset and saying this sucks. Uh, it should have been longer. The setting guide should have been twice as long. I think if this was 120 pages and you leave the other two books exactly how they are, I think people would have been happy with it. You fill this out with actual content, you play test your content and don't contradict yourself and it's solid. But I still think if you're really wanting to play in this setting, I still think it's not bad as long as you're wanting to do a little bit of homebrew, which is why when I first read it, I was okay with a lot of it because anything they said that was stupid, it was like, I'm just gonna change that. I shouldn't say stupid. Anything that they said that I thought was not thought out very well, I could just change. As I said earlier though, I have some guides and videos coming out on how you can improve some of the combat or things with this setting. If it's already out, it'll be on the screen right now. Thanks for watching.